Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Jha and I'm a managing analyst on the healthcare team here at CB Insights. This presentation will be a preview of our upcoming state of healthcare report for Q3, which will be published next month. We have a lot of material for you today, starting off with global funding trends for the first part of the presentation. And then the second half will focus on specific industry trends that we've seen across different sectors. And for those of you that may not be familiar with the CB Insights platform, it provides data and insights that help inform our clients in their technology decisions. And you'll see some examples of the platform during this presentation. So before we dive into this quarter's trends, I wanna start out with a pretty broad question. Where is healthcare headed? In the last six months alone, we've seen this shift in consumer and patient behavior and also that of other healthcare stakeholders as more remote care options come to the forefront of healthcare services. And as a result, we've seen this accelerated push towards a lot of digital solutions that previously didn't get as much urgency pre-COVID. So for example, ways to increase automation in everything from drug manufacturing, supply chain logistics to clinical workflows. Also the widespread use of connected devices for remote patient monitoring and increased patient provider communication outside of just clinic visits. And we've also seen a bigger emphasis placed on how such passively captured data can then be leveraged for a personalized approach to care delivery. So these are some of the themes that'll be emphasized throughout the presentation as we think about what the future of healthcare may look like. And one of the ways that we think about this question is by evaluating industry trends and themes on a quarterly basis. We look at what's been going on in terms of funding trends, M&A activities, partnerships, and regulatory developments in key areas such as AI, telehealth, medical devices, and in particular, I'll be highlighting digital therapeutics later on in the presentation, which have received a lot of attention during the pandemic. And another impact of the pandemic has been the global interruption of clinical trials, which is why we've seen more discussions around decentralized trials this quarter. Women's health, which is becoming a larger market as reproductive health and other areas in chronic care gain more traction. Mental health, um, an area that we've seen a huge increase in funding activity this year. And lastly, health plans and benefits management. All of these seven areas will be covered in more detail in the quarterly report going out next month, and I'll be doing a preview of some of these today. So starting off with the funding trends that we're seeing in quarter three, what does it look like now and how does it compare to previous quarters? Well, in Q2, we saw a record in global healthcare funding reaching over $18 billion. It came back strong after quarter one slump during those initial months of COVID. And as it turns out, quarter three may actually be on track to beat this record. This is really interesting because despite COVID's continued impact into the quarter, it shows that funding hasn't slowed down. In fact, at the current run rate, it's projected to reach over $20 billion with a record high in deals as well. And this is partly due to the fact that we've seen more than 40 financings that are at least $100 billion, which we refer to as mega rounds. And it's already surpassed 31 mega rounds that we saw from Q2. And then looking at this by deal share, in Q2, early stage deals continue to decline, possibly due to investors doubling down on their existing portfolios amid the pandemic. And in Q3 so far, we're seeing a similar trend with early and mid-stage deals making up the same percentages of deal flow, but we're also seeing an increase in late stage deals. And then breaking this down by geography, we saw in Q2 that healthcare funding bounced back in both Asia and Europe significantly compared to quarter one. The funding nearly doubled in Asia, while Europe saw a 60% quarterly rebound, and North America saw a bit of a decrease. And what's interesting here is that quarter three funding in North America and Asia has already surpassed Q2's results. You can see here that while the funding in North America and Asia increased, from the previous quarter, the funding in Europe and in other countries outside of these three major regions look to be on the decline. And while we're looking at this from a geography breakdown, it's also notable that since our last reporting, we've identified five more unicorns, four of which are based in the US and one in China. 
In China, Waterdrop raised a $230 million Series D round last month, and it offers a crowdfunding marketplace for patients facing high medical fees. And in the U.S., more digital health companies such as Lyra Health and Semaphore reach valuations of more than $1 billion with their latest financings. And actually, all four of these U.S.-based unicorns are a part of our Digital Health 150 cohort this year, so I would highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. And speaking of digital health, we saw last quarter that the total digital health funding increased to reach $5.8 billion, which is a 22% increase from quarter one. And this trend is continuing into quarter three, with the global digital health funding having already exceeded last quarter's results. In fact, current projections show that funding here could bypass $8 billion, which would set a new record for digital health funding. I mentioned mega rounds a little earlier, and this is one of the metrics that we track along with the overall funding going into the sector. And in Q2, we saw a total of nine mega rounds in digital health, seven of which were US based. And so far in Q3, we've already seen more mega rounds in digital health than we've seen in any of the 11 previous quarters, which is notable because it goes to show that the ongoing pandemic is not dampening the amount of these larger deals going into the sector. As of mid-September, we've seen 19 so far, with 16 of these based in the U.S. and three in China. And for comparison, this is more than twice the amount of mega rounds from quarter two. And some of these deals include companies that are changing the way healthcare services are being delivered, including more integrated care platforms that allow both in-person and virtual visits like Village MD and Heal. It also includes those that have really doubled down on telehealth offerings and expanding their efforts there, such as Roe and JD Health. And those are just a few of the key industry trends that we've seen continue into quarter three. But before we dive into some of the other trends, I did want to quickly pause here and remind everyone to fill out the poll on which area in healthcare you think will receive the most funding this year. With a few more months to go, um, it should be interesting to see at the year end which areas ended up getting more investor dollars and also what new developments will have occurred in each of these categories. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I won't be getting into all seven categories of our quarterly report here, but instead I'll focus on some of these categories, including drug R&D, specifically around clinical trials, emerging applications of digital medicine, mental health, and women's health. So starting off with drug research and development, you know, this is an area that we've seen a lot of recent interest in even before COVID. For example, we saw a lot of funding going into AI drug discovery startups, um, more synergies between these startups and big pharma players. And many of these pharma companies are also building out their own AI drug R&D capabilities with companies like Novartis and AstraZeneca being two key examples here. And drug R&D is a very costly and time intensive process. It has a high failure rate and within these two large buckets, drug discovery and clinical trials, there's a lot of steps involved from conducting basic science research to identifying the right targets and compounds before being ultimately tested in animal disease models and in human subjects. To help address some of the bottlenecks within, the, within this traditional framework, a lot of different technologies are being leveraged to generate data that could not only help speed up this process, but also bring a new layer of precision behind it as well. So as I mentioned, um, many drug discovery companies are using AI to expedite the process of predicting the right drug targets and candidates. Along with that, real world evidence is becoming a bigger focus area for life science companies to optimize everything from commercial strategy to drug development. So for instance, it could complement um, traditional clinical trials and generating more detailed insights about the efficacy of a given treatment. And the pandemic further highlighted some of the key obstacles associated with clinical trials for everyone involved, patients, researchers, and sponsors. It showed just how crucial it is to modernize this process so that ultimately more innovative treatments can reach patients faster. Using the CB Insights news feature, we can see here how the media coverage around clinical trials spiked between February and July this year. 
This was partly due to the uptick in clinical trials being initiated around COVID therapies and vaccines, but also due to the global interruption of trials. A lot of the in-person visits were put on pause and many of the trials had to find alternatives for patients to continue participating, using video or phone calls for checkups or through digital questionnaires for tracking patient reported outcomes. Which is why decentralized clinical trials have been getting a lot more attention lately. Many of the tr traditional trials take place at physical locations or sites. And you know, this can be pretty difficult for patients to visit on a regular basis for checkups and tests. And you know, not only does this impact the number of patients that end up enrolling in these trials, but also those that actually stay on for the entire duration of a trial, which is really important. And this is why decentralized trials carry a lot of value because they offer a patient-centric approach, thereby making it easier for patients to participate from their homes by using technologies like telemedicine and remote patient monitoring. And then looking at it from the perspective of clinical researchers and trial sponsors, some of the key bottlenecks in the process include all of the manual and siloed parts of running a trial including data management and keeping up with regulatory compliance documents. Improving these clinical workflows can help create a more connected and collaborative platform for all stakeholders while cutting down on time and costs. And these companies shown here on the slide have been partnering with Biopharma and other digital health companies to help streamline this process. For example, earlier this month, Castor EDC announced its partnership with Click Therapeutics, which is a digital therapeutics company to help conduct fully remote clinical trials using simplified workflow solutions. And digital therapeutics, along with digital biomarkers and diagnostics, are all becoming bigger areas of interest for healthcare stakeholders. And this is especially the case with biopharma companies as they look to innovations that can complement their existing portfolios while also looking for new ways to support and engage patients as industry dynamics begin to shift. So one of these categories, digital biomarkers in particular, has received a lot of recent attention in Q3. Its applications range from speeding up preclinical research, detecting early signs of diseases, to serving as clinical endpoints in trials. And specifically within this category, there's been a growing number of use cases for voice and speech-based biomarkers, which are being used to detect early signs of one's health status across different therapeutic areas. So for example, they're being used to measure early signs of cognitive impairment, especially among the older demographic for potential signs of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. Another category of digital medicine that's been widely discussed in the last couple of years is digital therapeutics. And especially amid COVID, there's been more conversations around their feasibility and adoption, especially around reimbursements and regulatory approvals. And one of the ways in which this category is gaining more traction is through recent efforts to standardize the use of these products along with demonstrating their clinical evidence. For example, last month, 25 tech companies, including Google, Livongo, and Philips, they joined a new initiative led by the Consumer Technology Association to help establish more of these standards. And you know, back in 2017, the Digital Therapeutics Alliance was formed to create clearer definitions around what is and isn't considered a digital therapeutic. And since then, it's continued to release more frameworks around best practices to help clarify and answer a lot of the questions around this emerging category of digital health. Also, new studies are helping demonstrate the clinical evidence behind these interventions. This quarter alone, we've seen a number of studies that evaluated how different digital therapeutics could help manage or treat a variety of conditions from autoimmune diseases like lupus, chronic pain, to migraines. And also technologies like VR and neuromodulation, they're being explored as potential interventions presenting new avenues of treatment. One of the companies that raised the big round this quarter is Bioformis, which uses connected wearables and sensors for remote patient monitoring. And back in July, it announced a partnership with the Japanese subsidiary company of Bosch to develop a digital therapeutic to monitor and measure the pain associated with endometriosis, which is a gynecological disorder. And this helps illustrate the potential that digital therapeutics hold in providing new insights on medical conditions that have traditionally been difficult to understand or manage. 
So a lot of the data that's been collected through um, either passive methods via connected wearables or being actively logged by patients tracking their symptoms, that's all data that could help inform our understanding of conditions like endometriosis in which there's still a lot that we don't yet know. And mental and behavioral health is another area where the use of digital remote tools is helping expand access to lower cost care. And this is actually one of the most crowded categories of digital therapeutics. In quarter three so far, we've seen more activity here, um, such as the continuing trend of strategic partnerships and initiatives by pharma companies to build out their beyond the pill strategies. Especially with the impact of the pandemic causing increased levels of stress and anxiety in the general population, this space is becoming um, more of a priority. Last quarter, we mentioned how the funding in this space came down a little bit compared to the record high that we saw in Q1. And in Q3, the total funding is again expected to slow down, but we may see a slight increase in deal count similar to what we saw last quarter. However, if we zoom out and look at the funding in aggregate for 2020 so far, we've already reached a record compared to previous years. An area that's seen a lot of activity since the beginning of the year is emerging benefits for employers. So companies like Lyra and Ginger, they work with employers to offer virtual therapy, coaching, and other digital content for their members. And back in Q1, we saw a series of these deals for uh, these benefits platforms and this trend is continuing into quarter three with more corporates looking to expand benefits coverage during heightened levels of stress during the pandemic. And mental and behavioral services have also become a lot more differentiated to help cater to individual and community needs and preferences. So for example, Brightline, which offers therapy and evaluations for kids, along with coaching support for the parents. And Broadly speaking, we're starting to see more emphasis around better addressing the behavioral health needs of young children and teenagers throughout their development. And while we've seen a rise in mental health platforms focused on psychotherapy services with therapists and coaches, platforms that lean more towards specific psychiatric services like AHEAD are also starting to emerge. So along those lines, more companies are exploring mental health solutions specifically for women as well, specific, uh, especially as it becomes a core element of women's healthcare services. We're seeing the traditional ways of understanding and measuring one's mental health status being reimagined through digital platforms and also new affordable ways to access mental health services along with entirely different approaches to therapy sessions are helping create more options for women to choose from. So along with mental health, other areas, including oncology and cardiovascular health, they're starting to get more attention in the women's health market. And areas that have received more investor interest in recent years, such as fertility, their range of products and services are becoming even more expansive as this market grows. And the overall interest in women's health has really picked up in the last few years, as seen here with relevant news coverage of the market reaching a peak last month. This is consistent with the amount of attention that this area has been getting as market opportunities become more varied and comprehensive. So I mentioned a little earlier about how fertility remains a bigger area of interest in this market. And similar to what we saw with mental health benefits, fertility benefits coverage is becoming a bigger priority for employers as they think about talent acquisition and retention. In Q3 so far, we've seen more funding um, We've seen more funding go into this space. For example, uh, KindBody, which provides fertility services, is now also planning to grow its employer benefit solution. And Care Fertility works with employers to create customized benefit plans while also providing resources for their members. And while interest in um, women's health grows in the pu uh, private market, public companies are also starting to show signs of interest in women's health. Looking at the earnings call so far from Q3, mentions of women's health have skyrocketed, reaching an all-time high this quarter. Not to mention, we've also seen two major acquisitions so far. Uh, MedTech company in the women's health space, Logic acquired Excessa Health for $80 million, and Bayer acquired Candy Therapeutics for $425 million upfront. 
And Candy is currently developing a non-hormonal treatment for menopause symptoms, which is expected to enter a phase three trial next year. So as this market continues to garner interest, we could see different areas of women's health get more traction and help drive new solutions. And this concludes our sneak preview of our upcoming state of healthcare report for quarter three. We have a lot more research on the topics that I mentioned today. So if you are a client, you can head to our CB Insights platform for more of these insights. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation and feel free to reach out umbrella if you'd like to connect and talk more about some of these trends that I've highlighted today. Have a great rest of the conference.